So good morning. Uh, my name is Aaron Brown, one of the pastors here at St. Paul's, and I get to continue the series that we started a couple weeks ago called, ladies, are you with me? Wonder Women. Wait, well done, ladies. Yeah. <laughs> Wonder Women. Wonder Women of Scripture and our, our Christian history. And uh, the idea is that we look at their lives and learn from their stories what we can emulate to become stronger people of faith. Now, the one thing I, I kind of warned us about last week, I want to warn us again, this isn't about us looking at these, these amazing people of faith and saying, women, get your act together, be like they were. That is not what this is about. It is about all of us, men and women, young and old, learning from their stories. How did they push through tragedy? How did they deal with opposition? How did they, how did they confront the stuff that was in their minds they struggled with, in their hearts they struggled with, in their cultures that they struggled with? How do they live out their faith through all of that and shine the light or reflect the light of Christ in as many ways as, as possible? That's what our goal is. So far, we've looked at a woman named Lydia. She came from the New Testament. Her story is in the book of Acts, and she was a businesswoman, which is a rare, rare thing in that day for, her to be, for a woman to be independent as a, a business person. We looked at her being the first follower of Jesus in Europe and how from her home, which she surrendered to Christ, the world changed, Europe changed uh, from that home base. Um, then we also looked at Mary Magdalene, who was, who was a woman who was in Jesus, essentially in Jesus' inner circle, um, how he trusted in her and, and witnessed to her, and how she, in her own way, spread the good news of Jesus. We looked at Sarah, who was in the Old Testament, and now Sarah is uh, the woman who's mentioned more often than any other women, woman in the entire Bible. She is considered the, the, uh, the mother of three faiths, of Christianity and of Judaism and of Islam. And we look at her life and the struggles she had and the faith that she had and how she was uh, a hero of the faith and at the same time flawed, just like a lot of us at the same time. So before we move into... Um, uh, looking at the, the person, the woman of faith that we're going to look at today, I want to just encourage you to do two things. One is to take some notes, jot a few things down that you want to remember that you might, I don't know, share with somebody else. Remember, we're not here just to consume religion. We are here to be ambassadors of Jesus out in the world. So what you learn here today is not just for your own consumption. It is for you to be available to share with someone else that might encourage them in the story that you hear. So jot down notes. Second thing is to Use the study guide, which is available online. Uh, we have paper copies out in the lobby as well. But use the study guide to open up the book, right? That's one of our things that we expect of us on this journey of faith. Open up the Bible. Listen for God's voice within there. Don't take my word for it. Open it. Read it. Look at it. Process it for yourself. So, the Wonder Woman of Faith that we're looking at today is someone you may have heard of. Probably you have not. Her name is Susanna Wesley. And uh, even if you haven't heard of her name before, your life is lived differently today because of this Wonder Woman of Faith. What she did set the stage for a historical earthquake, a, a historical tsunami that changed the world, that raised up leaders, that made an impact, especially around the uh, realms of social justice and revival. The revival that her sons, uh, John and Charles Wesley, began literally changed the world. This woman changed the course of history. So as you look at her life today, Susanna Wesley's life, there are a few questions that I want you to have in front of you. You might want to jot these down. Number one, how can this woman's life change and challenge mine? How can I live a life more dedicated to Jesus through difficulties and tragedies? How can I invest my life in the next generation in ways that will make an ongoing impact? So as we look through her story, Susanna Wesley's story, just kind of keep thinking about those sorts of questions. Now, the first thing you need to know about Susanna Wesley is she was born Susanna Ansley to her mother and father. The, they were named Samuel and Mary. She was born the 25th child of 25 children. And all the women of the church said, oh, ow or oh, wow, I don't know. Amazing, utterly amazing, isn't it? Uh, you'll be amazed even more so coming up here. Now, um, she was born in England at a time when there were two huge shifts going on. There was a, 
a, a social and religious shift happening, and then at the same time that was going on, there was a, a moral decline going on in, in England at the time. So let's talk about those real quick, because we need to know the context, the background. So uh, in England, there was this divide occurring between people who were loyal to the crown and the king and the Church of England. So this started off really as a church split, but it infected everybody. So people that were considered themselves royalist to, to king and to the Church of England. Then there were those who were dissenters, who still believed in the, in the king and the, 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 the royal structure, but they just thought that, no, there has to be a different way. Um, and they were also not only dividing away from the, the king and the structure of royalty, but they're also dividing away from the way church was done, the way faith was lived out. They called themselves Puritans. So this was a divide, typically at the time, between royalists and dissenters, or the Church of England and the Puritans. And, um, and Susanna Wesley's father, Samuel, was a Church of England priest. But he, along with about 2,000 other Church of England priests, decided, no, we, we feel this call to Reformation and became Puritans. They withdrew from the Church of, of England and became this Puritan movement. Thousands of, of these priests did this. Well, that caused a lot of stir, and it was just a part of the division uh, of the culture at that time. Uh, by the way, just kind of a side note, um, when we look at the division that they had there, we might think of our own country and world right now and how divided it is. Sometimes if we turn back a few pages of history and look at how others were affected by their division, how others were affected by their inner inability to converse with one another and work toward compromise for a greater good, and if we can't learn from them, we are destined to repeat their history, which is not good. Just a, a little side note there. So um, we have that division that was going on between the royalists and the dissenters at the time. Then, on top of that, the moral state of England was in a shambles. Um, some of the things that I read were, that n number one, uh, the first thing that came up was gambling was so um, so just... A permeated, a permeated the entire culture. One uh, historian said that it was like England had become one vast casino. Along with that, and the poverty that kind of followed along with the, that uh, part of culture, um, infant mortality and newborns were left to die in the streets. Tickets to public executions were sold like theater tickets. The slave trade was a booming business, but making people question their own humanity. Alcohol, alcoholism was, was rampant. That's the world that Susanna was born into and grew up in. But she also grew up in a home where these things were talked about frequently. In fact, her father was, was a very uh, smart man. He was a very connected religiously, obviously, being a priest, uh, connected being uh, involved in the politics of the day. So his home became a gathering place for authors and speakers and politicians and, and clergy. And can you imagine a home full of, I don't know how many children they would have at any one time, 25 kids, but you know, grandkids eventually, all that. Can you imagine a home like that, then filled also with these, these folks that are gathered around a dining room table that must have been as big as a stage and, and talking and debating and sharing and, and asking questions. And one thing that's interesting about the, the Wesley or the Ansley family at that time Susanna's family, was that she was invited to the table to listen, maybe ask questions, to hear. Her father was unusual at the time in that girls were not typically educated in that time in England. They were not taught to read and write and, and anything else um, educationally. Um, they just weren't, it just wasn't done typically. But her dad made sure that she learned to read and write, and even beyond that, encouraged her to use his library. He had a personal library that was, uh, must have been substantial, of the classics. And so she would spend time reading and processing and thinking and hearing all these other folks that visited their house talk about life and morality and religion and all these sorts of things. And there was something interesting happened to her when she was 12. After all that she'd heard and read and seen, she decided that her father was wrong. Can you imagine a 12-year-old thinking that? <clears throat> but her father, the Puritan dissenter, she thought he had it wrong. And so when she was 13 of the age to join the church, she did not join the dissenting church. She joined the Church of England, much to her father's dismay. Can you imagine the kind of thing? But that's what her father, you know, I, I, he, he encouraged that sort of thinking, right? Um, but she paid a price for that. When 
His estate was settled after he died. All the children got a share of his estate except Susanna. Now, we don't know exactly why that happened, but you've got to wonder if it wasn't because she chose to be a part of the Church of England rather than a Puritan, a, a dissenter. Now, it was at the, the Ansley home, her home as she grew up, uh, when her father would gather uh, thinkers and speakers and, and all those folks in their home that she met her future husband. She's 13 years old. Her husband is also named Sam. Her future husband is also named Samuel, just like her father. He's 19 years old. They meet and they begin to, to correspond with one another. They're going to get married she, six years later. She's 19. He is 26 at the time. And um, the only way that they really knew each other over those six years of courting was not face-to-face -face contact because he lived, he was getting his training as a priest in England. The only way they knew each other was through the letters that they would send back and forth. So think about this. It'd be like developing a relationship completely via text, but very slow text. Like a really the slowest internet ever in history, back and forth. So it's probably no surprise that when they got married, they were shocked that they didn't have as much in common as they thought they would, and it set them up for a very, very difficult marriage, um, as you'll see here in just a second. So Susanna and Samuel got married and had their first child in 1690, and Susanna was with child every year after that for 19 years. So... Um, Historically, we're not sure if she, if she gave birth to 19, 20, or 21 children. What ended up happening in families then, because infant mortality rate was so high, right? Um, what ended up happening is when a child was born and that child did not uh, survive uh, infancy or childbirth, then the name that that child was given was, was oftentimes given to the next male or female child that was born. So she had either 19, 20, or 21 children Nine of those children, as far as we can tell, died in infancy. Pause there for a minute. Can you imagine the heartache? Having nine children die? Well, Samuel started off his ministry, finished his training as a priest in the Church of England, started his ministry. He was sent off to a rural village in the middle of nowhere, the home that they had was a mud hut with no glass in the windows. Remember, these are people that came from a rather sophisticated upbringing, living in London or the surrounding area. They knew differently. And Samuel, he really struggled. He resented the church that he was supposed to serve. He resented the people of the village. He resented the home that they had to live in. And, you know, there's, there's resenting things and then there's just letting everybody know you resent everything, he could not contain that stuff inside. So he made a lot of friends, as you will see. They barely made enough to feed their family. <clears throat> so Samuel tried to support his income with farming. He was a terrible farmer, ended up losing everything that he tried to plant or grow or whatever, um, and ended up in the process going deeply into debt. He would uh, eventually spend time in debtor's prison at least two or three times over his lifetime. Um, he made bad decisions. He struggled with depression. He would leave Susanna with the children for long periods of time. Um, I want to tell you about one of those. This happened when uh, Susanna and Samuel had a disagreement about who should be the rightful king of England. Something, you know, it, it, it might come up, you know, who, who's the rightful king of England? And the country was divided over this because the reigning King William became king by marriage. He was not in the bloodline that a king should be. A lot of people believe that James II was the rightful king of England, but he was, he was in the bloodline, but he had been exiled for some reason. I'm not exactly sure why, but the main point is this. Susanna and Samuel saw this on opposite sides of the spectrum. One evening... The family had prayer time, as they did every evening. But this particular evening, Samuel prayed for King William. And as he wrapped up his prayer with Amen, he noticed that his wife, Susanna, did not say Amen to his prayer with him. And he was infuriated. And he's like, you have to say Amen. Because then if you don't say Amen, you're not blessing the king. And you need to bless the king. And she's like, I'm not blessing this king because I don't think he's my king. You can imagine these conversations, can't you? 
He's like, no, you've got to bless the king. She's like, you can't make me. So here's what he said, and this is, this is written in the, in the history of the Wesley family. He said, uh, writing to a friend, if she will not share my king, I will not share her bed. So he grabbed a horse, rode off, leaving her with the children for a year. We're going to celebrate him on Father's Day. <laughs> Gosh. Well, two things, he he ended up coming back, right? After a year, two things happened that brought him back. One is that a true heir took the throne uh, as the king of, of queen of England. It was Queen Anne, and Wesley's house burned down. The Wesley household burned down, almost killing one of the children, destroying all of their property. Um, Samuel decided that it was right for him to come home and help rebuild the family home. What a life, huh? So far. So through all of this, all, while all that's going on and having children and doing, uh, uh, dealing with her husband, Susanna knew what her primary purpose and role was in life, and that was to educate her children. Remember, typically, you know, girls were not taught to read and write at the time. They were not educated, but Susanna made it a priority because, listen, this is important. It would affect John and Charles and the, the Wesleyan movement later on. She believed that faith in God could only be sustained with a sharp mind and the ability to reason well, and she wanted that for her girls as well as for her boys. Some consider her to have invented formal homeschooling, and she was very, very methodical about how she did that. Does that word catch in your mind a little bit? Methodical. So as soon as, uh, here's how she handled this. This is part of her methodical nature. As soon as children began to utter words, when any of her children began to utter words, she took that as a sign it was time to teach them the Lord's Prayer, which became the foundation of their prayer lives. So as soon as they could speak, they learned the Lord's Prayer. They would say the Lord's Prayer together as a family every morning and as a family together every evening. When a child hit his or her fifth birthday, that's when their formal education began. And there were textbooks available to help you know, educate children at the time, but none of them, did she think, were adequate. So Susanna Wesley having all these children around, decided to write her own textbooks for her children and their education. She wrote uh, one volume, and these are all available. By the way, you can, you can still purchase these online. You can purchase all of her writings, which uh, she journaled regularly. All that's available online. Um, but uh, she wrote one textbook on the natural world, a science textbook, so that she could learn that way. Uh, they, she wrote one on the Apostles' Creed, and it was based on the Apostles' Creed, but it broke the Apostles' Creed down in a way so that it taught the basics of uh, common education, the Ten Commandments, which is used to explain law and justice. Uh, so, so the girls and the boys, over the course of their lifetime, learned science, math, law, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, poetry, the classics, history, and music. And she taught all of them all of that. Oh, and she would also spend one hour a day, one-on-one -on -one, uh, with each child, one hour in rotation each, uh, per day. So that, you know, if she had 10 or 12 children in the house at any given time, she would have one hour every 12 days or 10 days with each child to make sure that they knew that they were loved and uh, give them attention. She took care of her household and taught her children and tried to make ends meet. Um, no matter what she was facing or what she had to do, we also know from her diaries that she wrote, that her, her journals, that she always spent time every single evening in Scripture and in prayer and in devotion. Uh, now, she also needed a little bit of alone time once in a while, other than those devotion times. So she was known to, uh, just to have a little bit of private time, she would take her, her apron and put it over her head while she sat in a rocking chair, and the children knew, don't mess with mama, all right, when the apron's over the head. I mean, today, what would, we, what would we call her today, knowing what we know about her? I think we, she'd be in that category, if you know what I'm talking about, of super blogger mom. She'd have millions of followers wanting to know how she did it. People would want to know all her tips and tricks. She'd be on the talk show circuit. She'd probably have her own uh, reality TV show like the Duggars, ironically, 19 kids and counting. Her books would be on the bestseller list. She'd be like Rachel Hollis of today. But this was the late 1600s, this was the early 1700s, and women couldn't vote, they could not hold pu public office, they could not speak in church, they could not choose who they married. I mean, all that is 
the culture in which she lived. But as we look back, we can see that, that it's clear that Susanna Wesley set the stage for the Methodist movement to include women as leaders and pastors and bishops. But none of that was open to her in her time and in her life. So, life was hard for Susanna Wesley, but at least it got harder. In 1705, her husband uh, somehow, well, we know how, he got cross with a local politician. And what he did was he supported this politician publicly, and then he found out something about him he didn't like, so then he withdrew his support publicly. Well, the, the other supporters of this particular politician took that as a major offense, and then they just decided to terrorize the Wesley family because of that. So they would ride by the Wesley's home, and the children were playing outside, and they would, they would tell the children that they were going to be homeless. They would tell the children that goblins were going to invade their home. They would tell the children that they were going to die. Then on the night of the election, the one that he you know, was kind of talking about and withdrew his support from, on the night of the election, uh, supporters of this politician gathered around their house, firing off guns in the air, uh, pounding on the house, beating drums until 3 a.m. Now, Susanna had just had a baby three weeks earlier. She had a nursemaid that was helping her um, with the infant. After all these people left about 3 in the morning, everybody's exhausted. The nursemaid is exhausted. She had the infant. The, the nursemaid fell sound asleep, rolled over on the infant, smothered it. Smothered. Susanna's newborn child. They had another house fire in 1709. All the children got out except John, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist. He, he was a, a little boy then. He was on the second floor, and he was only saved when the neighbors got together. As just before the house collapsed, they we got a picture of that. Uh, the neighbors stood on each other's shoulders, reached through a window, grabbed little John Wesley. Uh, then the house collapsed into a pile. And um, John's mother, uh, Susanna, always thought that was a sign that God had special plans for this son of hers. And boy, did he. Susanna's life was just filled with tragedies and challenges. But one of the lessons I learned from her is she never quit. She never gave up because she had a mission. She had a mission. That mission affected everything. So um, in 1712, her husband Samuel had to be out of town for an extended period of time yet again. And so uh, a, another pastor was asked to serve in the church and speak on Sundays, and that pastor was just terrible and so bad that, I mean, there, there are actually letters about how bad this guy was. And Susanna feared for the souls of her children in church, so when she would get them home on Sunday afternoon from church, um, she would get books of her father's sermons or get copies of her husband's old sermons, and she would read to her children and say, okay, you need to hear the good news of Jesus. So she would read to her children. Well, some neighbors stopped by while she was doing this, and, and they said, what are you doing? Well, I'm just teaching my kids. They, they need to hear the good news. So uh, the neighbors stuck around, and then they invited some friends to come, and then those friends invited friends to come. Um, one report I read said that at, some, at one point, there were 200 people gathered in her living room, kitchen, and outside the house with the windows open, listening to her preach. Well, the guest pastor that was you know, kind of filling in for her husband did not like this, wrote a letter to her husband, Samuel, and said, your wife is, how did he put it, conducting illegal church meetings. She must stop. So Samuel writes back to Susanna and says, you are conducting illegal church meetings. You must stop. And she wrote him back and said, make me. <laughs> so what she wrote back was something to this effect. She wrote, I'm going to stand before God someday. And there is no way that I can excuse myself from sharing the good news of Jesus. These people's souls are counting on this. And she did not stop. When Samuel got back from his trip, the church had nearly doubled in size. After losing her home to a fire twice, going through the death of nine children, living with this delightful husband of hers, in dangerous towns where people terrorized them, facing abandonment and loneliness and wondering often how she was going to find ways to feed her family, she was able to write this prayer in her journal. 
Help me, O Lord, to make a true use of all the disappointments and calamities in this life in such a way that they may unite my heart more closely with Thee. So back to one of the questions we started with. How can I live a more dedicated life through difficulties and tragedies? You know, tragedy can can drive you in the darkness or pull you into the light. So much of what it does is what we choose. We see in her the tenacity that might tell, I don't know, somebody in this room, don't you dare give up. Don't you dare quit. So she raised her children. How she raised them, how she taught them, not just to learn information, you know, but to process information, how, how, how to understand the Scriptures, how she taught them to understand the world around them, how she taught them to interact with people, how to interact with difficult people, how she was methodical in doing all this. Well, it led her son, John, to become one of the greatest leaders in history. It was Susanna Wesley who set the stage for John Wesley to change the world. It was his mother who equipped him with a sharp mind and powerful faith and a work ethic and the ability to withstand any tragedy that life could throw at him. And life would throw some tragedies at, at her son John as well. And the Methodist movement that he and his brother Charles started led to these world-changing revivals and social reforms. I, I want you to know some of the social reforms that John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement that he's responsible for, he played a key role in the abolition of slavery and the slave trade. Because of him, there, was, there were massive reforms in the justice and prison systems. He played a key role in ending child labor in England. John Wesley founded clinics, medical clinics, and schools for the poor who had none of that accessible to them because he knew without basic health care and without basic education, the poor didn't stand a chance. He inspired the establishment of dozens of other organizations and private societies that were dedicated to caring for the poor and for people who were suffering. He even fought for laws against cruelty to animals in a day where that wasn't heard of. The Methodist denomination, so there isn't just Methodism, there are all, all kinds of Wesleyan denominations, the Nazarene Church and, and uh, the Free Methodist Church, so many different Wesleyan traditions point toward him that encompasses about 80 million people worldwide, along with thousands and thousands of schools, colleges, universities, hospitals, orphanages, and all this began in a humble home packed with children where education and knowledge and faith and kindness and justice were taught and modeled by Susanna Wesley. Everything we see that John Wesley did had its start in her can't help but think of the description of a godly woman in, in the Old Testament book of Proverbs, Proverbs 31. Let me see if you picture Susanna in this. A wife of noble character is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She gets up while it's still dark. She provides food for her family and portions for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, and her husband praises her. Charm is deceptive, and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned and let her works bring her praise. Now remember, we're not looking at Susanna Wesley and saying, all right, women, get busy. No, we're looking at her life as a call to all of us, men and women, to see the power of investing in next generations. See the power of the Christian home. You've got to remember that the church for you parents, moms and dads, the church and grandparents who are raising you know, grandkids, um, the church is here to partner with you in raising your, your children so that they, they choose at some point to say, yes, I see the light of Christ and I want to be, why would I not want to be a part of that? It's a partnership. You don't just hand your children off to us and say, all right, it's your job to make them Christians, you know? It can't be that way. Do you know why it can't be that way? Because, because we've crunched the numbers, right? 
Um, so in our children and youth departments, our, our staff and our volunteers, and many of you volunteer there, we have about 40 hours a year with your children and youth. Do you know how many hours you have as parents or grandparents raising kids? You've got about 3,000 hours with those kids. It's got to be a partnership. And, and we want to partner with you to see that happen. And, and as followers of Jesus, it's our responsibility to, to see that happen. And, and not just if we have kids of our own, but, you know, maybe you don't have kids yet. Or, or maybe you're an empty nester. Or maybe you never had children of your own. But all of us are called to work, to invest in next generations, to teach and model a life of faith, of learning, of cooperation. That's a responsibility for everybody. Nobody gets a pass on that, ever. And that can happen when, when you step up and step out and serve in our children and youth areas. I mean, if you feel that nudge, you follow that nudge. Our, our children's department continues to grow. Or when you step up to serve with CASA, you know, maybe it isn't serving here at church. It's serving at CASA, which is court-appointed special advocates. It's a, a new thing that's happening in Jasper County that's changing the lives of kids that don't have advocates. Or maybe it's through bright futures, tutoring, mentoring, being a lunch buddy, or br- building bridges out of poverty and investing in in impoverished children, giving them a sense that there is hope and possibility and a way out. Susanna's life, I think, can inspire us to think about living beyond ourselves and find ways to share our faith, our life with others. So here's the question. Where are you creating your impact for the next generation? I would just challenge you, find at least one way. If you're not doing it in at least one way, Find one way, your way. There are thousands of ways to do it. Find your way to invest in next generations. So Susanna Wesley, let's bring this to a close here. She got all of her 10 surviving kids raised and out of, out of the house on their own. I won't be surprised to you to hear that some of them struggled in their marriages. Hmm. Some were successful in life, some were not. Uh, John took his mother into his home um, after his father died, um, John took his mom into her home, and she lived with him in, until 1742 when she died at the age of 73. And I love the way this, this one author put it. Um, Despite poverty, illness, a difficult marriage, and heartbreak in endless forms, she used her intellect, creativity, time, and energies, and will in such a way that can hardly be reckoned the world, here's the, the thing that grabbed me, the world in which we live owes much of the goodness in it to her life. Her final wish was that uh, on her deathbed she would be surrounded by her children and when she died that they would sing a song of praise. Not about her, but a song of praise about the God that she lived for. And that's exactly what they did. Susanna Whistler a true wonder woman of the faith, the mother of Methodism, the mother of some of the greatest social reforms in human history, and a life worth emulating for all of us. So the three questions we started with, one more time, let me name them. How can Susanna Wesley's life change and challenge mine? How can I live a life more dedicated to Jesus through the difficulties and and tragedies? How can I invest my life in the next generations in ways that will make an ongoing impact. Susanna West, Wonder Woman of Faith. For today, that is the good news. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together.